Testing audio. Testing audio. Testing audio. Where should the audio come from? How's it going? Okay.
Hello, Kako. Welcome to the 2022 Nalukai Hoike Showcase of Student Learning. My name is David Clark. I'm the Executive Director of Nalukai Foundation, Nalukai Academy. For the last 10 days, I've had the great privilege of hanging out with these folks. A number of students from Oahu, Kauai, Maui, and the Big Island. They came together not knowing each other. You might be surprised by that when you see them work together. They came together bringing their home, bringing their community, bringing their experience with them to share their stories and to come together to learn about entrepreneurship. And along the way, I think it's true to say that you learned a lot more than just that. Is that correct? Yeah? All right. We'll introduce you to them in just a moment. Nalukai is a big endeavor. We bring people together, help them learn how to work in teams, help them pick a problem that they want to focus on, understand problems with greater nuance, greater understanding, so that they can develop solutions. And these are problems that, that inspire them. They fall in love with the problem that they're trying to solve. And along the way, the solution that their group comes up with. I don't get to do this alone, luckily for me. I have an amazing team. We have facilitators who have joined us from literally around the globe this year. The model that we practice at Nalukai, our facilitation team is made up of an industry professional, someone who has experience working in entrepreneurship. Someone like Austin Stewart, our director of curriculum. Uncle Austin. We bring together an industry professional, an innovative educator, someone like Aaron Shorn. And the third person in our triumvirate of Nalukai facilitation team is a cultural practitioner. This year, embodied most by Pomai Bertelman, who spent an immense amount of time with this year's cohort. The reason, yeah, give a, a hand to it. The reason that we do this is because we believe that if you're going to be starting endeavors in Hawaii, you should have an amazing grounding in the culture that is here, in the aina. And these students got a great deal of time talking about those concepts, experiencing those concepts. Two days ago, they were at a fish pond, Hale Olona, down in Hale Olona, down in uh, Keokaha. They spent the afternoon working together and learning about the importance of a place like this, about how the water is monitored from coming from upland down to the ocean. And the person, Uncle Luca, who was with us that day shared, most people who work in fish ponds right now know that these fish ponds are not going to last a long time. With sea level rise, various other environmental pressures, they know they're not going to last all that long. So why is it important? Why is it important that we, that we work in them? And I asked the students that after we came back. I said, why do we do this? And why do we do this at an entrepreneurship camp? In addition to the cultural grounding that we hope you have. And May Kanata, one of our founders, as we call them, um, answered that like the entrepreneurial experience, the educational experience that, we're, that we are running right here, it's important to learn the skills, no matter what. It's important to learn the practice so that fish ponds can be moved up if they need to be, but the practice of learning how to maintain one or restore one matters. And she said, that's kind of like what we're doing right here. We certainly hope that you will fall in love, you at home that are, that are joining us, those here, that you're gonna hear an idea and you're gonna think, oh, that would be really neat. How do I find out more about that? How can I support that endeavor? We'd love it if their business model, if their businesses take off. And yet we also know that the practice of doing this will eventually lead to greater success in any endeavor that they're gonna do. Whether that's applying to college, getting a hui together to come up with a business, entering a local competition, putting a business plan together. There's lots of skills that we go over. 
In addition to our tribe facilitation team, we were also uh, joined this year by, by a few other uh, facilitators. May Somali came all the way from Australia to be with us. Someone who'd lived in the venture capital world had, had heard pitches, presentations from a number of startups over the years as her organization helped fund them. She shared with the founders not only her expertise in doing an effective pitch, but also in creating a community, a culture, where startups can thrive. May, thank you for being with us. In addition, we had Mara Garcia come from Oahu, who helped attend to the social emotional, I would say needs, wants, what we all needed in order to help build team here. Because we have a diverse group of students by purpose, by design, we have, in a typical year, we have about a third of our students come from public school, a third from private school, a third from charter school. From Kauai, Maui, Oahu, Hawaii Islands. Diverse group of people, different schools, different backgrounds. How do you come together? And when you learn how to come together in team, I hope that you all have seen that the end product is so much richer, so much more effective. And we hope that you really enjoyed learning alongside and with each other and from each other. We also had Alan Murabayashi come from New York City. He spent a number of days with us, helping us understand how to do research, how to understand a problem with nuance so your solution can address the real problems that are there. He's an inspiring speaker, the person who likes to poke holes in our ideas and make us look at it from a different angle, question our assumptions. And you all have done that beautifully. So a shout out to Alan, who I know is, is joining us online right now. In addition to that, we brought a number of alumni team leaders and staff members together, people who have gone through the Nalukai experience. I'd like you to stand up, please, if you are a Nalukai team leader or staff member. Thank you so much. And Miranda, would you please join me and speak on behalf of the team leaders? Miranda was part of our first cohort back in 2016. Eight cohorts later, seven years, Miranda joined us for the first time as a team leader and a member of our social media team. Would you mind saying a few words? Thank you. Aloha, everyone. Aloha. My name is Miranda, as Uncle David said. I am from Kohala on the north side of this island, and I was a member of Nalukai's very first cohort in 2016. And I'm so honored to have returned as a member of the media team throughout the years and as a team leader for this incredible 2022 cohort. As a recent college graduate, I look back and reflect on the things I learned at Nalukai, um, many of which are the same concepts I explored in my upper level business and entrepreneurship classes in college in the San Francisco Bay Area. So what you have here is so special and so important. It is amazing to me that at 15 years old, I was given the space to claim agency and resources to carve a trajectory into the business world and get a head start, knowing that I don't have to sacrifice any of the values that I grew up with in order to go into entrepreneurship. More than technical skills that I learned at Nalukai I reflect on the way that I grew in such a short time. And every time I've returned, I've grown such as much, just as much, and I think it's all because of you guys. Nalukai is a centering place for me where I can turn to, um, where I can return to, and where I can cherish. To our founders, I've seen you grow so much in amazing ways in the past 10 days. I'm amazed at your receptiveness, acceptance of one another, and your tenacity in approaching the problems you see in the world and in your communities. You began this camp by exploring these problems and in less than a week, which is crazy, <laughs> you were researching, pivoting, and pitching these solutions that I think are so incredible and I'm so excited to see them. And I'm also so excited to see the ways that you continue to impact your world in Hawaii after Nalukai, and I want you to know that you've already impacted me in such a, such a meaningful way, 
And I know that all of the other team leaders and facilitators feel the same way. What I wish for this group of founders is that you feel safe to learn here, even after this program ends, that you feel seen and heard and drawn to return to this place and to one another. You are your support system. You are your network. You're a network of amazing and incredible people. And you're now part of a community that is growing every single year, that is so diverse, talented, and supportive. And it's really special to be a part of that. And I'm honored to have, to have known you. Mahalo for sharing your light. It takes a whole community. I hope you've seen that. I hope you've enjoyed being part of our community. We have certainly, certainly enjoyed being a part of yours. We're very proud of the work that you have done. As I said before, it takes a lot to put this program together. The vision of this program started a number of years ago. A former student of mine, too many years back for me to admit to publicly, um, a young man who went off and hit it big with a couple of inter internet startups, moved his ba family back to Hawaii. His name is Darius Monsef. He goes by Bubba or Bubs. And when he came back, he wanted to offer a gift to students like he was, that they could learn to start endeavors, businesses perhaps, community art projects, community projects. He wanted to offer the tools that he felt he had to learn on his own. And so he put this program together, recruited me to come work for him when I returned back home to Hawaii. And it has been an honor to offer this program free of charge to 182 students over the years. We provide them with the tools they need to start endeavors, to work as collaborative groups. We equip them with a laptop that they take with them to work on the ideas perhaps that they first envisioned with us, and more importantly, the new endeavors that they're gonna have further down the road having learned these tools and methodologies. There are other supporters that I wanna thank as well. This year in particular, a group called the Koi Pond Initiative. They are residents that live largely on the Kona Coast, the Kohala side, Kohala Coast. Um, they came together and said, we wanna make a difference in this community that we, that we get to live in or get to visit. And they helped fund us this year. We also received support from Kamehameha Schools, the Hawaii Community Foundation, some local Companies up in Waimea, our original home, West Hawaii Concrete, the UPS store. Um, they, they have pledged or promised or delivered on um, financial support because it's not a cheap endeavor to bring everybody together. And this year we got to come together as opposed to being online, which we had to do the last two years. So you all were the resurgence. You were the first group to come together, and it has been so deeply rewarding to work, uh, to work with you. So I'd like to give a hand to those that supported um, Nalukai this year, personally, or businesses that came and said, yes, this is worth investing in, the young people that we brought together. So thank you. And now, since I know you didn't come to hear me speak, I would like to introduce you to the founders, the 2022 cohort. Would you all please come up? And so that our audience that's online right now, we're going to squeeze in here. Come on up. And very quickly, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself, the school you came from, the island you came from. And then they will get to know you, our audience will get to know you more when you do your individual group presentations, which are coming up real soon. So, let's start over here with Ethan. Hi, my name's Ethan. I'm from Oahu, and I go to Mariner School. Hi, my name's Amelia. I'm, wait, what? Oh, I go to Iolani School, and I'm from Oahu. Hi, my name is Jackson, and I'm from Oahu, and I go to Kalani High School. Hi, my name is Dylan. I'm from Maui, and I go to Maui High School. Hi, my name is 
Jasmine. I'm from Kona, and I go to Kalakaia High School. Hi, my name is Scott Watanuki. Um, I'm from Iolani School, and I'm from Oahu. Um, hello, my name is Hannah Moses. I go to St. Andrew's Schools on Oahu. Hi, I'm Lily Mitchell. I just graduated from Kamehameha Schools, and I'm from Oahu. Hi, I'm Mahina Hardin from Punahou School on Oahu. Aloha, I'm Kuali. I'm from Big Island, and I go to KS Hawaii. Aloha, my name is Chloe Silva, and I just graduated from Kamehameha Kapala. Hi, my name is Rasen Katsura, and I am from Oahu, and I just graduated from Punahou School. Hello, my name is May Kanata, and I go to Kelke High School on the Big Island. Hi, I'm Kalei Pollock, and I'm from Oahu, and I go to Wailua High School. Hi, my name is Jamie Cortez. I recently just graduated Milani High School, and I'm from Oahu. Hi, my name is Miley Leiji. I'm from Waimea, and I go to Kealakehe on this island. Hi, my name is Sela. I go to I go to Waimea High School, and I'm from the island of Kauai. Hi, my name is Kinoni Bridges. Um, I'm from Oahu, and I go to Kauai High School. Hi, my name is Benedict Thierry. I came from Waimea High School at Kauai. Hi, my name is Tano Hattendorf. I'm from Oahu, and I go to Kamehameha. Hi, my name is Shinoa Konan, and I'm from this island, and I attend Kekulo on Avihio Planeo Pu'u. Aloha, my name is Logan Lau. I just graduated from Kamehameha Schools, and I'm from Oahu. It has been our sincere honor and privilege to work with you folks over the last 10 days to watch you grow. I did the first airport shuttle for those coming in from other islands. And I got to say, some of the conversation on the way back, what was it? A little awkward, right? On our first day. I'm kind of pointing out some of the sights, some of the things, right? Remember that day? Let's go all the way back there and think about how much you've grown and think about how close you've become. It's been such a privilege to work with you folks. And I'm excited to see the result of all of your labors, all of your hard work that you've done over the last 11 days. So students were put in teams. They chose a problem they wanted to focus on. They understood and researched that problem. And then they came up with solutions and then honed in on one. And then maybe changed their mind a little bit and pivoted a little bit and then came together and came up with a solution they wanted to test. And they built a minimum viable product that they could float out in, the, in their communities through their social networks, through doing customer interviews, to question the assumptions they made about their business, about the solutions they had for the problems that they wanted to address. And I think you've done it beautifully. So today, you get to see their pitch presentations of their solutions. I'd like to introduce Mr. Aaron Shorn, who's going to be our master of ceremonies, um, calling the different groups up. Congratulations, everybody. Deep breath in. Deep breath out. Deep breath in. 
deep breath out. First group. So this is our product, which has three functions of being furniture, garden, and a composting. So how it works is you get the organic waste. This is our organic waste. It is. Okay, and then you put it inside the inner pipe. Do you want to Yeah. <laughs> and then you twist it three to four times a week. And then after some time, you should have compost that you can put inside your garden to make it look a lot more luscious. <laughs> okay, so the dimensions... Oh, the dimensions of this product are 5 feet by 2 feet by 2 feet, and the exterior material is wood and the inter material is plastic and the dimension is about the size of a coffee table. What about the smell? Oh, and to prevent any smell, it is airtight. Okay, so after creating our product, we wanted to compare it to other similar companies, such as Simple Human, Subpod, and Miracle Grow. And we use characteristics such as use of space, multifunctional, customizable, cost-effective, and volume based And as you can see, we have checks in all of them. How is it customizable? Well, that's a good question. It'll come in many different colors, and there's also two products available. What do you mean by cost-effective? Cost-effective means that you get a lot of bang for your buck, and it's three products in one, so you don't gotta spend your money on all three. So we are planning to sell our product on our website, exclusively on our website. We are a for-profit business, and so we are selling two different models, an interior design, and an exterior design. The prototype that we just showed you is our interior design. And even though the price seems a little bit high, if you're thinking about having to buy fertilizer, having to buy a garden, and then also having to buy a coffee table or entertainment center, the price is gonna be much higher than what we already have for our product. Additionally, this, it will keep your fertilizer going, so obviously you don't have to keep buying it because you're making it yourself. 
Additionally, we are going to connect um, users with different seed providers uh, so that they can supply their garden with local seeds. And we will also provide them composting resources so that they know how to use their composter properly. So far, we have created a social media where we are going to pre be promoting our business and also interacting with users. And here is just another um, look at our website. So for our, I'm sorry, for our MVP portion, we've put up two different prototypes on our website and our Instagram because we wanted to test and make sure that people actually did want to compost inside their home and wanted a multifunctional device. So through our research, talking to people, and monitoring our Instagram and website clicks, we have found that people are very interested in composting both inside and outside, hence the two different types of models. Also, we have gained over 120 followers in the past 48 hours, and on our promoted ad, 214 views that reached 411 people. Additionally, our website had 49 views, 14 of which came from our Instagram ad. So you may be thinking, why us? Why these young people up here? So I think even though we are young, that is um, an advantage because as Hannah said earlier, all of that CO2 and all that methane going into the environment is making it so that we might not even have a future. We might not even have the opportunities that a lot of people have. So we are very passionate about fixing the environment and giving people opportunities to compost. So introducing to some of us, this is Hannah. She is our project manager and she's a very talented scientist and she's very knowledgeable about composting. So she can help connect users with proper composting information. This is Ethan. He is a brilliant product designer and has come up with lots of wonderful ideas about how our product can be multifunctional and fit users from a different houses, different spaces, and different desires. I'm Lily Mitchell. I'm the head of marketing, so I've been working with promoting our social media. I have a background in fine arts, so I can help the aesthetics look nice. Additionally, I also have a background in botany, so I can help connect users with proper information about how to grow their garden. If you want to support us, please check out our website at ubucomposting.co or our Instagram at ubucomposting. Please help us give waste a new life. Well, that was a wonderful presentation, and now comes the Q&A. Um, my first question for you, and feel free to um, answer it, um, and then when you're answering it, you can say it right in front of you. Okay. A deliciously <laughs> awkward say. Um, Do you see that? Oh, yeah. There you go, I like this, good. Um, so my first question is about process. How did you go from coming together as people that didn't know each other to ideating through problem spaces to what you saw today? Anyone can jump in. Um, well, I guess we'll start off, we originally first got in our groups to do the PSA assignment uh, where we had to like pick a funny topic um, and then make a video about it. So I think that helped us broke the ice and like learn about each other and how we work. So when we got to the actual like grit of Novukai, <laughs> we were already introduced to each other. Um, I'm talk about the ideation and so. stuff. <laughs> um, for our problem, when we were trying to pick it, we started off with a very broad and big topic, environment. It was a lot of work. I think it took us a few hours to finally narrow it down. And we got to household waste. And then through interviews, and a lot of interviews, we finally got to our product. Um, I think what really brought us together was kind of struggling through like mm. sometimes like 12 hours of you know slides and a lot of activities. <laughs> A lot of group work, so yeah, I feel like you're struggling and the intense workload really brought us together. <laughs> <laughs> I I'd like to open the floor up to the audience that's here. Um, please feel free to raise your hand, speak loudly. These wonderful founders can respond. Any questions?
Please. So you have the price for the two versions. Is there a maintenance program that goes along with it? So we will sell the barrels, the inside part, the tube, on its own so that people can get replacements or extras if they need. They can also always contact us if anything. Great question. So my question for you is about um, how you grew um, both as a team but also individually through this process. Um, I guess as a team, we definitely found our groove after a while. Um, it seemed a little disjointed at first, I think just because we were all like, struggling separately, and now we struggle together, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> um, and I guess me personally, I um, I guess something that Mr. Clark always says is that people that come here usually don't like to do group projects, and I am one of those people, but through this process, it's taught me a lot to trust in other people, um, and it's really, it's really wonderful having such a wonderful group and people to bounce ideas off of and just hearing what they have to say. You guys are brilliant, so I appreciate it. So you, I saw you engaged in a lot of different customer discovery interviews, um, both on campus and on the phone. Can you talk a little bit about that process, whether that was new for you or kind of what you learned throughout it? Um, well, for me, I've done interviews before, but never to this extent. It was a lot of getting into contact, like finding personal contacts, and then from there, finding people outside of our circle. Um, it was hard at first, I think. We had to get questions together, talk to people we didn't know. But I think after the first like, 10, 15, I think it got easier. Yeah. I was really surprised through the process how open everyone was to speaking to us, especially because we have such a quick turnaround. The emails would be very sporadic. They'd be like, hey, are you, are you available to speak tomorrow or today at, like, in, at 1 o'clock exactly? <laughs> and most people were very, very open to being like, oh, yeah, we'd love to help you. So um, that was very refreshing. Lily, we have these evening um, talk stories with these incredible um, guest speakers, um, storytellers. Was there one that really stood out for you, either connected to your product or connected to your experience? Um, they all were brilliant, and I guess it's hard to pick just one. Mm -hmm. But the one that's point, um, that's pointing out to me right now is Auntie Pomai and her husband. Um, so they talked about sustainability on the Hokulea and how instead of packing like canned foods from the mainland, they made all of their food, canned it, freeze dried it in Hawaii. Um, and the reason why this stood out to me is because I'm going to college away from Hawaii. And I really want to eat squid luau when I'm in college. <laughs> and so I just thought it was a very innovative approach to um, bringing home wherever you are. Because I guess if you can eat, can you eat squid luau on Hokulea, I can eat it in my dorm across the world. So it gave me hope. <laughs> How about food? Um, I personally liked our, what was it, the Kanaka Partnership. I think that definitely gave me a different perspective because I think when we all think about entrepreneurship, we think about these super rich people <laughs> that are just like <laughs> craving money. Um, but that presentation really taught me that you can base a business locally. Like you can, you can use your, the resources you have and the opportunities you have to support your local community and really help it grow. Mm -hmm. One more question from the audience. How about um, Ethan, have a speaker? Go for it. Oh, sure. um, let's see. My favorite speaker got to be um, Cards of 808, mm -hmm. I think, because they let us use all their stuff, like the whole presentation, so really interactive. And also, they gave me a free product. <laughs> free of charge, told me. <laughs> Even though I had to run up to them at the end, because they were trying to get away from me. <laughs> we, we have a question from the chat. Um, how easy will the models be to put together? So we're going to provide instructions online on our website. Um, and. Hopefully, with the instructions and a little help, because we're only a call away, you can put 
all the materials together in the kit by yourself. Like Ikea, but better. <laughs> <laughs> Big round of applause. For you. spend their own personal funds to make their classroom supplies and resources useful to their students to ensure that they have the quality education that they need and deserve. $591. That is how much students or teachers in the state spend every single year in Hawaii for their students. This is out of pocket. And considering that they only make so little, this is unacceptable, and this should not be the status quo. I'm Mae Kanata. I'm Kalei Pollock. I'm Sayla Puni. And I'm Rustin Katsura. And, and we, we are Po'olako Kumu. Po'olako Kumu means to supply to teachers. The word lako, as we mentioned earlier, is an accumulation of supplies and essentials that a community needs to sustain and support itself. Thus, this is what we aim to do as a nonprofit organization. This is Jerika Naputo. She is a first year, sixth grade special education teacher teaching at Maili Elementary. As a first year teacher, she will make around $35,000 this year. And as we said before, teachers spend up to $600 out of pocket to make sure their students have the quality resources and supplies that they need. Jerika says it is all for the cakey. We have to do it for our kids. She also wants the community to know that their support makes more of an impact than they will ever know. Much like a wedding or baby registry, where people can request necessary items, teachers can give their own teacher registry, where they can ask items for their classroom. Here's an example of, of Jerrica's two registries, one from Target and one from Amazon. These are inefficient because it, helps, because it stops them from connecting with a wider group of people. It keeps them obscure and hard to find. Sadly, organizations like Donors Choose and the HSTA have similar issues because they're hard to find. Our mission at Ho'olako Kumu is to donate meaningful supplies to local classrooms in order to promote student growth. This way, teachers can take home more of their already limited income without having the financial burden in order to support them. The process is simple. So, community members and donors, and teachers as well, can visit our website. From there, donors are able to add any amount, 5, 10, 50, on a subscription model basis. From there, that money will go to the teacher registries, who register and create a supply of lists that they need. Teachers can also prioritize which items that they need when they need them. There will be specific dates, the month and the day, that the teachers need these supplies. Also, Instead of having just close friends and family be able to support these registries, having these things in the links, in their bios, we would be the platform to amplify these teachers' voices, to broadcast what they need in the community. For those of you who are teachers, you would visit our website to um, come to the register page and register as a teacher. Once registered, you may list your school, create a bio, and of course, create your registry where you can prioritize the items that you need and also the dates that you need them by. And after that, you sit back and let uh, Ho'olako Kumu take care of that for you. And from there, we will broadcast it to a wider audience. For those of you who would like to donate, visit our donation page. And you will have the choice to donate between sponsor a class or donate to our organization. From there, you can choose the amount you would like to donate from our subscription-based model. We chose a subscription-based model, so those people, those people who want to donate will not forget um, to donate because there's always teacher registries that need to be filled. And from there, we will take the money, go and fulfill teacher registries, and donate them straight to the classrooms.
Now you may be wondering, what makes Ho'olapu Kumu so different from all of these other amazing organizations? Well, things like Amazon Wishlist and GoFundMe do great for crowdsourcing, but they're obscure and hard to find. Organizations like Donors Choose and Adopt a Classroom do great for donating classroom supplies, but they're not centralized in Hawaii and for Hawaii's needs. And local community base like the HSTA and school donations don't prioritize classroom materials. However, Ho'olaku Kumu takes all of these amazing traits and puts them in one centralized location. In the span of only 48 hours, we gained a mass 70 plus followers on our Instagram and reached 2,446 individual accounts and we had 329 interactions through our ad campaigns. 33% of those on our Instagram page have visited our, webs visited our website and we have four people willing to donate to our organization and also six teachers who are willing to sign up and that have registries that they need to fulfill. This is our team. Rustin is the web design lead. Kalei is the marketing lead, May is the product manager, and I'm the graphic design lead. I gained a passion for graphic design through my experience in school. My school was able to provide me with programs such as Procreate, Adobe Illustrate, and Adobe Photoshop. However, while doing research for this project, I found one of my art teachers on Donor's Choice looking for donations for her art for classroom supplies, papers, pencils, paintbrushes. This is unacceptable. May also found one of her teachers looking for STEM supplies, looking for books, looking for paper. Teachers have to take money out of their own pockets and they're also asking for donations on top of that. I would like, our team would like, to provide teachers with an easy option for, and for donors an easy way to support the teachers in our local community. You all have the opportunity here to help us support our education system and teachers and Katie. So donate or register a teacher or your school today and help us bring the education and supplies we need to help our Keiki succeed. We will now take any questions. I'm a teacher, so I love that presentation. Um, Kalei, um, there's this idea of being in this large community of um, 22 founders this year. Um, but there's also this power in being in a small group with this team of four. How do you weave between both? How is that meaningful for you? Well, I knew I had a goal to meet everybody here out of the 22 founders. So my goal was to eat a meal with all of them and get to know them all, because we have an excessive amount of group time, as, these, as you guys have heard. So we really got to know each other as a group on many different levels. And it was really good for us to get to know what we like and didn't like. But I also know taking the time and like the opportunity to speak to everyone and get to know everybody a little bit more than I did than surface level was a great opportunity. And you definitely had to take your own initiative to do that. Mm. May, this concept of makahanaka ike by doing one learns was um, really central to this experience. Um, and how we go about delivering curriculum, asking you to immediately implement it, and then giving you this kind of unstructured time in the afternoon. How is that either different or um, uh, powerful for your cohort? I think what's really impactful about Nalukai in general is that we only have 10 days together. If this was a longer period of time, it would be a completely different experience. And I think that being able to compact all of that curriculum into several days is what made it so meaningful to me and my group as well because we were kind of just thrown in there and kind of we had to figure it out as we went and it wasn't about making it completely perfect it was about the journey and how we kind of grew as a team together oh, thank you um, i think that um, you really embodied um, community on so many levels and i think that was a really powerful way of seeing your team grow too for you um, you had many pivots. Um, tell me how you went from the problem space, honing down into something that is much more scoped in, and then getting to a solution. Hmm. Okay, so I think a lot of a lot of people believe that you kind of start with a solution and see like where your solution fits in. But the thing we were taught was to start with a problem and find all the little things that 
are, I guess, would people would overlook and that it's often missed. And as we started from those little tiny, I guess, nuances. And we dove further and further in to see, is this the, is this the right path? Is this, is this what is causing a lot of the problems? And so forth. And I think that's kind of how we honed in our topic. Mm -hmm. Lovely. I think we have three islands represented on that, in this team. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Um, and we have different diverse technical skills represented on this team. Sayla, can you talk about that experience of being on a team that has diverse backgrounds and diverse technical skills? Oh, it was wonderful. <laughs> it was great. I loved when we would have downtime, because we did spend a lot of time together as a team, but it wasn't constantly work, 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 work. We got to know each other on what I think would be a deeper level than you would ever expect to get to know someone within 10 days. Mm -hmm. I got to know everybody's, the things they were passionate about, especially when we were first presenting our original problem spaces that we personally cared about. And it was wonderful getting to hear about STEM and medical and just all of the different things I never would have even thought about. Mm. Like, as an artist, I'm pretty like, oh, pretty, I want to make pretty things, <laughs> right? <laughs> so like to hear technical equations and to hear the, the deeper meanings and how they find their passion and hear them speak about their passion in something that I'm completely new to was wonderful and refreshing. And just, it was beautiful. Thank you. Questions from the audience? I see some teachers in the audience. I'm not staring at Matthew Williams in particular, I'm staring at you all. But maybe he has a question at some point. Matthew Williams, shocking, thank you so much. <laughs> we had to test was whether or not, one, if this was a big enough issue, or two, if people was actually willing to give us money or like to donate to teachers. Because, you know, they always say that, oh, if it was an easy fix of a problem, then it would have been fixed already, you know? So our overall issue originally was that teachers aren't getting enough access at all. There's a lack of teachers in the HIDOE. So we looked into the reasons why that is. Low pay, um, lack of funding and COVID were all big issues that we had to address. But because this issue was too broad, we decided to zone in on one thing, the lack of access and the lack of materials. So when we did our interviews with our teachers, with educators we had access to, and people who were just in the education space generally, a lot of what they talked about was that a lot of these funds were coming out of their pocket and that they would love some extra support. And so I think being able to provide this extra support in a way that we can amplify and not only show a wider audience that this is an issue and that they can help contribute to it in an easy and precise way, but also being able to provide these materials at all was a really wonderful thing to learn and work towards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Joelle Cabasa, I saw a hand. So yes, we actually were talking about it as a group and we wanted to pull from many different areas because as you saw that a teacher we used as an example had Target as well as Amazon. So we were thinking about using many different platforms and reaching out to them to see if they were willing to work with us so then we can have a whole different variety because many things we researched, they had limited, like what you're saying, items on their registries. So we wanted to provide as much as we can for the teachers. So that was what we decided to as a group and we need to reach out to those companies. Going off of what Kalei mentioned, um, we were also looking at the case study of the teacher, and I was looking at her target wish list earlier, and I realized that some items were out of stock. So I think the way that we want to cultivate this platform is to include different platforms like Amazon that might have that item, as well as Target, so that all the items can be supplied instead of just ones that are on the platform at the time. Mm. So. Um, I wanna mahalo your team for an exceptional amount of empathy um, really displayed throughout the entire process. Thank you so much.
Aloha. 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 Welcome, Naokai founders, facilitators, families, and community members. My name is Ben X Hearing, and I have the honor of introducing Panali, a student led business that addresses the issue of the youth not having enough access to musical instruments. At face value, it seems that young, the, our youth are not interested in music. However, the bigger problem is that our youth actually doesn't have access to musical instruments. While conducting research for our product, we found that over 40% of kids in Hawaii have never played a musical instrument. That's 14,000 kids. 14,000 kids that don't have the resources to pursue their musical endeavors. Music is incredibly valuable in our development. Music has helped improve motor skills and it builds self-confidence. So Panali, our company, is trying to create a solution that engages the youth and also brings these benefits to our kids. In order to do so, we have to understand our community. To understand the needs of our community, we interviewed 16 of our fellow peers and mentors. We asked them questions about how music has affected them, also other questions depending on the person that we were interviewing. This is one of the quotes from one of our interviewees, and we think that this quote conveys the main message of, of the effect that music has on people, which is that feeling or sense of belonging that people feel because of music, which is a feeling that we've all felt because from music. So let us introduce ourselves. Once again, my name is Ben Akiri. I'm a Filipino dance performer, and I fell in love with the ukulele when I created a community and, a, and an elevated sense of the law in my school. My name is Maida Leiji. I'm our project manager, and taiko drumming has helped me connect with my Japanese culture. I'm Shinoa Kwanan. I am the media manager of our company, and hula has made me feel acceptance and also taught me discipline. My name is Kainoa Hattendorf. I serve as the spokesperson for this company, and songwriting and guitar has taught me how to relax and de-stress after a long day. You know, music is it's so important in my life, and to think that kids my age lack the resources to pursue their musical endeavors, it's, um, it's truly heartbreaking for all of us. So we've come up with a solution that will solve this problem. This is the Pahupana. Pahupana in Olala Hawaii means beatbox. The Pahupana will serve as a musical fidget that includes the sensory elements and sound elements of a musical instrument. Now, the Pahupana is practical and it's an alternative to musical instruments, like I said before. It will be targeted for kids ages four and up. Our 3D design was built using CAD or Fusion 360. And in my hands is a 3D printed model of our iPhone. And this is actually enlarged for your guys' convenience, twice the size. And in the Pahupana instrument, it has a ukulele. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> the ka kalaba, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> the trumpet, and the piano. <laughs> but after 14 hours of printing, our team was excited because this was our first step to seeing our product come to fruition. So, oh. Fidget toys are very popular among youth, over 92 million users daily. Fidget users have had a 27% increase in their test scores as well. Our solution is combining the best of both worlds, bringing music and fidgets together. Now, after conducting some interviews, we found that teachers actually don't want all this noise in their classrooms, right? <laughs> Who would have thought? So we created three designs. Our first design is our muted fidget. This will come at a lower cost while also including the sensory elements of a musical in instrument. It will be no sound. <laughs> this is our acoustic vision. Uh, our acoustic fidget is our second version. It will come at a medium cost while including the sensory and musical elements of a musical instrument. It will produce sound. And finally, we have our third unique electric fidget. This will come with an on and off switch to feature both muted and acoustic sounds. So once again, we'll be targeting Hawaii's youth, and part of our profit will go towards community programs that work to encourage music production and instruction. So of the listed companies, we'll be having partnerships for donations and distribution. For donations, we'll be sending these companies money to support their cause of bringing music to Hawaii. 
For distribution, we'll be selling our products to these stores in order to engage with a larger audience. We compare ourselves to many other products out there. And in many other companies, they only focus on fidgets, instrumental musical, and musical education. But none of them address all three. And that's what makes us special. Our product incorporates all three of these aspects together. And we don't have any competitors. That's what makes us unique. And the Panali product uh, services are the musical instrumental, uh, fidget, and an educational. Another way you guys can support us is by checking out our social media. So we have a TikTok, and our first video got 400 views. And then we also have an Instagram, and we have 61 followers on that. And both of them are at the, pa are at the handle panali.hawaii. If you guys are interested in our product, please view our website and join us in our cause of inspiring Hawaii's youth. One, One note, note at, at a time. time. Mahalo. Mahalo. but once you get to know, know me, I'm kind of talkative, you know? Like, I like connecting with people, who would have thought? <laughs> but, um, yeah, I'm actually in speech and debate, so public speaking is kind of natural for me. Right. Yeah. So it, it, it was about kind of building trust. And kind of growing yeah. Um, ben, I think the same for you. But it was amazing watching you come out of your shell. Um, you came in amazing, but it was really powerful to see you deliver a presentation. Um, how did you find meaning in the product, but also in the community? I found meaning in this product by connecting it to myself. As I said, I, I do love the ukulele. And as for, what's it called, the community? Mm. Um, as for the community, I also, because in my own school community, I love to, I guess, play the instrument, and we love to jam. Mm. That's how I felt that sense of belonging as well. Thank you so much. Miley, um, we have this incredible, um, guest speaker named Sydney Wicking, who was joined by our very own Mae Somali. And they talked about levels of leadership. And they talked about weaving between these levels of leadership. Not always leading from the front, but leading from the back, leading from the side. Tell me about the evolution of your team. Tell me about your own journey as a leader. So I remember, I know another group mentioned this, but we had a PSA assignment where we had to create a fake PSA and then deliver it as this team. So that first day, it was literally our first day at camp, and there's a lot of awkwardness and a bit of tension. And I knew that in order to work together as a team for the next couple days, there was gonna be somebody who had to lead going from the front and pushing everybody forward. And I really pushed myself to try to take on that role as a team. And as we moved forward into the program, um, the slots just kept filling, like the roles of our team, the people who were working together. Uh, the guest speaker had talked about the different roles of leadership which is leading in the front, leading from behind, beside, in the field. And I really feel like each of my team members were able to have that support in all of those areas, regardless of me trying to push them forward and have a mm, envision. <laughs> Shaw, um, I think something that makes Nalukai powerful is its connection to indigenous knowledge and Hawaiian culture in particular. That was really displayed in your product. Um, and the cultures of all of you were displayed in your product. Can you speak to why that is? Okay, so the product itself is made to encourage more kids to um, get into music and be more in tune with music. And I personally think that's very important because I go to Hawaiian school and we do um, do hula. Uh, hula is an actual class that we get graded on. But it was also very special for me because um, I was in hula class and then I joined the halal. And I felt acceptance mm. within that halal. Mm. And I also felt supported. And mm. halals are really different because it's kind of like a second family. 
So through music, I was able to find, you know, in a sense, a second family. And I want other kids to find that sense of belonging and acceptance because in a world where everybody's different and sometimes you don't always feel accepted, um, you should definitely find that place. And I want more kids to find their place in this world. Mm, that's beautiful. Audience, questions, feedback, some love. So, you know, when you guys first stated the problem, I was like, oh, you know, I wonder what direction to take it in. And it was very, it was an unexpected solution. So kudos for such creativity. And as a mom of three girls who love fidget toys, I get it. So <laughs> I'm like, you got something going. Um, but also from an like, investor perspective, I'm a little curious in how you thought about pricing. Can you think of, explain to us a little bit about the process your team went through to figure out what the right pricing is and how you want to position yourself in the marketplace? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go. So our muted fidget is obviously going to be less expensive because it doesn't actually have music to it, right? Um, our acoustic fidget is going to produce sound, so it's a little more expensive. And our electronic fidget is kind of on the pricier end because it does include a muted and non-muted version. And it uses electronics to do um, what it does. So that's how we came up with it. I guess adding a little bit to that, um, with the specific price, we thought about the types of materials that we were going to have. So when we were brainstorming, we tried to figure out a solution that could incorporate recyclable plastics or something that's more eco-friendly. Um, and also we wanted to ensure that it was affordable, but also that we were getting enough profit to dispense towards donations and being able to support our community programs. Okay. Any other questions? David Clark. Tell me about how you pivoted. Because where you started as a team, right, we're exactly sure. You tried to bring your interests together. Or who, who wants to solve what problem? And you went from, in some ways, being the most, not ununified, but just you each had different things that you wanted to do. Mm. How, tell us about the journey of coming together to where you came up with one of the most cohesive products um, that we've seen. Right, so it goes back to that, <laughs> that sense of leadership, right? So we all fill different positions, and through that, we could see sort of a common goal that we all had in mind, and we connected all of our values and all of our ideas into one pahupana. Right. So. And, so, and that common goal that you had was what? To serve kids with... What? <laughs> We wanted to get music to kids. Right. That's what we wanted to do. Awesome. Thank you. Great job, Thank So in March 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic brought work and education to our homes like we never imagined before. However, our desks and our rooms were created for those purposes. Our desks specifically became classrooms, meeting rooms, even lunch tables, and sometimes a movie theater. And so we We've seen things like this happening um, at our houses, quite frankly. Um, some people tried to use um, like toilet papers and try to like use um, things that they had in our homes to um, kind of work in different situations, different um, types of environments. Um, but, but the fact is that these are not desks. Um, and a lot of people were getting stressed in the way that um, they didn't have much uh, resources in terms of um, having different ways to work in their house. Um, and this is kind of like a different um, image also. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. So the inflexibility of space has really taught us that the importance of space that we need um, in our environment. And so that's why here at Jamspace Dex, 
we want to bring a change to your desk. And we want to revolutionize the way that we use desks. Because we know that space is very important. And more space can help us increase our productivity, happiness, and creativity levels. So traditionally, the way that we measure space is horizontally. So if I were to go buy a house, I'd ask something like, how many square feet is the house? But that's not all there is to space. Space goes vertically as well as horizontally. And there's a whole world of unutilized space in homes across the nation. So here at Jam Space, we're revolutionizing the way people use space. And our desks go up and down. So the way this works is that there are tracks that you would put on your wall, and the desk can be moved vertically up manually, and to release it, there would be a lever on the bottom. This is an example of how it would work. Um, so we can use this sitting down, um, standing up, or to any purpose that you would like. So our product is made of um, American steel, 100% locally sourced wood, and everything that the desk is made of would be made in Hawaii. Because not only do we care about your space, but we care about the community that we live in. Here's a glimpse of our competitive landscape. Desks come in all shapes and sizes. However, manufacturers are not consistent with the quality of the materials they use and their space-saving design. Two things we value at Jam Space. As you can see, our product is in the top right. Unlike the Wayfair and Amazon products you see on the bottom right, our desk will last more than a year. And unlike the products on the left, which are um, more higher end, um, and these IKEA products, our products are made with space in mind. We know that the flexible furniture market is estimated to reach $4.8 billion by the year 2025. This is partly due to a decreased apartment size and rapid increase of urbanization. So we know that people are really in need of smarter ways to use their limited spaces. Our main revenue source is gonna be through product sales on our website. As you can see, our product, the Elevation Desk, will be $300, which is around half of the price of a comparable desk on the market right now. And so when custer, customers order from the website, after around a week or so, they'll be getting a box at their door with all the parts and an instruction manual inside the box. So this is uh, our social media st statistics. This was um, supposed to test our assumption of if people really do need space. And as you can see, we got around 1,600 impressions, which showed us that people really cared and needed space. And translated to 59 website views, um, which is around 3.7 uh, conversion rate, which is double or around double <laughs> the average conversion rate in the furnish furniture industry. Meet the team. We are a group of students who felt the struggle of finding a place to study. Meet Scott, our head of web development. He has been the person working to make sure our customers have the best interactions on our site. Meet Amelia. She's the person behind all of our prototypes using her experience with CAD. And meet Jackson. He's our head of social media. <laughs> this guy knows how to meet a wide audience. 
and my name is Mahina. I am our head of content creation, and I work to culminate our vision with engaging media. So you can visit us at jamspacedesks.com, and on our website, uh, we'll have more um, details about the products, and you can also subscribe to our newsletter to get more updates about our products. And you can also find us on Instagram and TikTok, um, and we have about seven posts on Instagram right now that uh, describes what we're trying to do, our mission, our values, and why we're doing this. Thank you very much. That is something I will 100% purchase when it is available. I have zero space. I moved to the Bay Area and paying way too much in rent. Um, we throw way too much at you over the course of 11 days. Um, Austin Stewart is an incredible director of curriculum um, and also goes the uh, water hose approach, which I think works, works well. Um, what's stuck for each of you? Mahina starting first. What element of curriculum um, will you take with you going forward? Definitely um, the approach of starting with the problem and really getting a deeper understanding um, because um, secretly, we actually did this pro project in about four days um, because there were so many different um, problems that interested us. Um, but I think this is really the one we stuck with um, and all found unique um, like introspectives into why um, we really liked tackling this issue. Um, and I think that was very powerful. I think uh, part of the curriculum that stuck with me the most it's probably the testing our assumptions because I didn't realize that we would have that many assumptions before we actually brainstormed how many assumptions we had. Mm -hmm. We came out with like six and that was surprising to me because I thought it would be way less. Mm -hmm. um, something that really stuck with me is like Mahina said, um, just like getting to know everyone here and like making sure our project collaborated all of the skills that we had and make sure that we also had fun doing it. Cool. I think for me, um, I also agree with Mahina about the problem, starting with the problem. Um, I have a little bit of experience in um, startup and entrepreneurships, but I find like the biggest issue is that starting with the real problem that actually exists. And I think we jump to solutions very quickly, um, sometimes really too quickly. So I think this um, program has given me the, a great foundation to really start with a problem and identify our assumptions. Um, yeah, that's Thank nice. you. So we have a question coming in. Um, do we do some snaps? Mm -hmm. We have a question coming in. Um, will you have a video that shows how to build it? Will the, will the metal rust? Um, I haven't gotten into the details of exactly how um, this will be manufactured, mm. but I'm sure that if it does rust, we can deliver another replacement mm. for that. And we'll definitely make sure to have resources and um, possibly videos on our website um, to buy, provide um, ample instruction on how to build it. Yeah, I mean, I purchased an up desk, which is like a bougie stand-up desk that goes back and forth. And the putting together of it was like, I don't know, a seven hour affair. Um, <laughs> fortunately, I had a friend so that I didn't get divorced in the process. Kind of helped me build it out. Um, but what I loved about your idea was how simple it was and how simple it seemed, you know, to kind of add it to a wall. Can you talk about the design of it, you know, from CAD and so on? How did you come up with that design? Um, we just brainstormed uh a lot of ideas. Our first design was actually, we realized, really stupid. So we, we had to redo that. And um, a lot of the process was just, you know, through catting and through collaborating on what we wanted from this desk. Okay. Questions from the audience? Go for it. I didn't realize like, what your logo was until just now. Like, why is it, why is it a squid? Um, in one of our posts, I say um, to squidify your home. And this idea is that um, squids hide in their environment, and we think that your workspaces should be hide into your home seamlessly, um, kind of in a way where you can put it away, forget about it, and not constantly have that reminder in your home. 
because in our research we did find that homes where clutter is present and visible causes stress and doesn't create that environment that you want to see in your everyday life. Thank you. Welcome to Novel Pie Snaps, everyone. Um, one last question from the audience. Nana. Um, I share a question about your process and did it change the way your perspective on space? Since that's a huge thing that you guys have talked about at the beginning. It's like people being introduced, like not introduced, but like thrown back into their home space and real world spaces. How that perspective on space has changed. Yeah, like. Uh, Amelia said in the presentation, uh, usually whenever we think of space in our house, it's usually horizontal and like you want to move stuff around that way. But our design going vertical has really changed my perspective on how we think of space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we pulled in our personal experiences from the pandemic, like just being trapped in my room. <laughs> I kind of wish I had more room to like throw out my yoga mat and practice in the area where my bigger desk takes up. And just having that multifunctionality of spaces um, is really important to us. Thank you so much. My name is Dylan. I'm Kuali. And I'm Jasmine. Together, we're Kanahui Ike. Growing up in urban Hawaii, I felt a sort of disconnect to my Hawaiian heritage. And that was why it was so empowering meeting Kuali. She's so proud and involved with our culture. I wanted to see more of that in myself. And I realized that a contributing factor to my lack, to that feeling of disconnection, was a lack of exposure to Olelo, to our native practices, and to like native forests. And really, it was, it was the lack of Aloha Aina. Um, over the course of Malukai, I was kind of introduced to this term, whitewashed. Um, and I, I have so much appreciation for like, and respect for like people like Shanoa who come from immersion school where they like olalo and they do culture. Like I came to a program like just before Nalukai where we learned to like ulana lohala with the lohala plant, like that big pokey tree that pokes your fingers. Um, and I think it's really important for children and people of all ages and like from all history and past to have access to those plants. And we want those plants around like forever, as long as we can for the world as well. Um, so, I, like I said, native plants are important because we want to sustain our culture and perpetuate the legacy that our kupuna gave to us. So, really just continuing on with Ike Kupuna. Along with the cultural significances of native Hawaiian plants, they're actually really important to the environment. They serve as protection for our, our island's watershed. They are a really efficient form of carbon capture. And they provide um, habitat and home for species in the wild while introducing biodiversity into our forest. Okay, so meet the team. I am Kuali. I do like the product design that you see later. And Dylan, he does our web design. Both Jasmine and Dylan do web design while Jasmine does more outreach and communications. And Dylan does creative content. See, this is an issue that needs to be addressed because currently 44% of all of the endangered species in the United States are located in Hawaii, while we make up less than 1% of the country's entire land mass. And with those remaining native Hawaiian plants, 26% oh. <laughs> of those, over a quarter, are currently endangered and threatened. So this is definitely a problem that needs to be addressed. 
The real problem here is that um, native plants here that are trying to be restored aren't getting enough funding. And Hawaii has already recognized that by creating the Plant Extinction Prevention Program. Um, however, however um, they are working very well, efficiently, enough to um, save the plants here. But they recently got a massive budget cut that really is tearing away at what they're doing. So we created Kanukua Ike. Kanukua Ike is a nonprofit, business to business, and business to customer community that creates, designs, and publishes these coloring books. So you see our cover and maybe one of the coloring pages that you would get. So this coloring book is. Oh, where's the book for? It was back two slides. It's there? Yeah, you passed it. Oh. Oh, there she is. Um, so you can see, if you go to our website, we'll have a link to that later. We have the book, and you can buy it, and it's including like all these native plants and endangered plants that you see in Hawaii. I mean, there's some that like only one is left, or it's like that, and it's really effective because 90% of the visual, 90% of the information that's transported to your brain is visual. So retention of the words that you'll see on the pages is like highly likely. Yes, yeah, so we just recently launched our Instagram, and however, it isn't doing the best. <laughs> but with proper marketing and some advertisements, it is projected to grow. Um, Kuali, you can talk more about the pictures if you like. Okay, so these pages, you can buy the coloring book, and you can also buy the individual pages, I think it's like $2, so you can print them at home if you don't want to buy the whole physical product, and you print it on the go, or because your kids are super bored in your workspace. Um, distribution? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Koli mentioned that you can download these images online at the price of $2. And this makes it a convenient and easy way to have art like at your fingertips. And in terms of distribution, Dylan actually had some really interesting ideas about who we could like market to. So he was talking about airports, you know, because while you're coloring on an airplane, you might as well be like getting some really useful like cultural information as well and restaurants, you know? Kids like do the little coloring while they're like waiting for their food. And also local bookstores, retail, and um, our product reaches a wide audience from kids wanting to learn more to adults wanting to reconnect with their heritage. Yeah. And because we're selling a product, we are generating our own revenue. This money is going back into the business, but the majority of profits are also going to two existing organizations focusing on plant restoration based in Hawaii. So those would be um, Terraformation and PEP, which is the Plant Extinction Preservation Prevention, Prevention Program. Um, so they do like seed banking, stuff like that, because native seeds, they're like, they have to be kept in a very specific environment with like the humidity and temperature so that they're more viable when they're planted into the earth. So these are really valuable companies and organizations that without their proper funding, they can't function properly. Wonderful. Okay. When compared, <laughs> sorry. Um, when compared to other businesses, other coloring book businesses, we notice that a lot of them, well, they're engaging to native plants, but they lack, um, well, the ability, the ability to do it online or down or download it online, and they also don't donate any of the proceeds to existing um, organizations. Yes. Thank you. So this is just like an artist that does native plants and like a coloring book, but they don't do e-coloring books or donate to any organization. So these are the people that are mentioned in previous groups from like Cards for 808, they publish like coloring books for KK. Like yeah, and um, these are our handles. So if you want to either connect to our Instagram, um, find us online at our website, kanuhuaike.com or um, email us to uh, get updates. Yeah. So we do have an email list. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so Koali, you have this ability to 
never hide how you're feeling in any moment. Um, and it makes you so powerful and so authentic. Um, what did you authentically connect to at Malachi? Um. I really like the freedom that you get at Nalukai. Like, you don't have to pursue, like, in school, you have, like, a very set curriculum. Like, you're not exploring your own pathway. You don't get to, like, elevate yourself and your learning process. So here at Nalukai, they really give you the opportunity to, like, explore and expand. And people came up with, like, really creative, like, solutions that I wouldn't have thought of, like a tinker toy or, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I just really appreciate it. Thank you. Dylan, storytelling is a thread, one of the most important threads. Um, and you are a storyteller. That came through in your application, um, and you really shine in this experience as a storyteller. Can you talk about um, either the skills that you learned or how you leaned into your own kind of skills as a storyteller? Oh, that's a hard one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think one of the biggest skills that I definitely had to go through again was communication, especially mm -hmm. with people that I just met. So I think communicating is, def is definitely one of the biggest ways to um, tell stories. So communicating with my team and everyone here, learning about everyone's you know, differences and interests and all that, I think it definitely, I think it definitely helped. Thank you. Um, I love the B2B model. I love the idea and immediately see Hawaiian Airlines, if you're listening, um, Alaskan, <laughs> um, United, um, and maybe a few others, um, some of the puddle jumpers as well. I see this completely implemented in being passed out. So that's a great revenue source that can be in large packages, right? Not just $2. Um, I see this in restaurants. I see this as a way for um, tourism and tourists to understand where they're coming to and have a bit more reverence when they land. Um, how did that play in to what you were doing? How did you get to that idea of going B2B, and not just B2C? We really wanted to reach out to the community, become a part of the community, make partnerships, and really be integrated in that way where we're not competing with other already established organizations and businesses, but rather have it be like a collective sort of thing mm. where we're all gaining from each other's existence. Thank you. Um, we talk a lot about the minimum viable product, um, a small working version of a larger idea, and it was really powerful watching Koali draw that first draft of that image. Um, can you talk about that process? And, and now that it's kind of getting out into the world, um, how does that make you feel? Oh, I'm, I'm stoked. Uh, my art process, like through the years, I feel like, like at school, you kind of express yourself like that. Like I know I said that, but it's like really important to me that people can express like, their artistic ability. Like you have the option to pursue art if you want to pursue art, right? So just having the freedom, like with my own devices, so thank you to my family for sponsoring my devices, and being able to like just draw on your own need and like just release your artistic vibes and energy. Like, you need to. Thank you for doing that. I remember many years ago when teaching at HPA, Austin came to the board and in his Austin Stewart handwriting wrote, real artists ship. Just the idea that getting your art out into the world is such a powerful piece and I think you manifested it. Questions from the audience? Um, so you guys say all your art is original drawn by you guys and you also said that you have started selling some of it online. Have you considered turning some of those artworks into like NFTs mm -hmm. or Different like areas on the internet people ask us. What did you stand for? <laughs> um, fungible tokens. Okay, okay. <laughs> Koali actually had a pretty good idea to um, have a section of her website where we have like pre made, pre colored versions of her art where you can like buy it as a poster, buy it as a postcard. Does that sort of answer your question? I love, I mean, Beautifully. Um, I love the question. I mean, it's such an interesting way of thinking about Web 3.0 and just different ways of engaging with the web. Um, other questions? Matthew Williams. You beat Joel Kabasa. <laughs> Great job. <laughs> I'm really in 
charge this time. Um, <laughs> I've had, I don't want to like diss the school system, so I hope my recommend it, my recommender is not on this call. But um, I had a really interesting talk with Aaron and David, where they they don't diss the school system, but they point out the flaws, right, and what you can do to improve that. Which is why I said I really appreciate and respect, like fully respect, um, Navahi, Komeke. Immersion schools, and I really, I would like to see more art focused, more art based, creative methods of allowing students to express themselves. Like, I want more opportunities for Native Hawaiian children mm. because, like, not everyone gets to put their stuff up in an art contest, and not everybody gets to go to like a song contest, you know. Mm -hmm. So, that's important. Adding on to that, um, Kamali mentioned an art contest. We actually had an idea sort of in the making of like, having a student-led edition of the book where it's like a bunch of students' art that they mm -hmm. applied and sent to us and then we put into this book so they can have their art published. Mm -hmm. I love that. Joel Kablasa. Would you folks be willing to transform some of the art and um, content into something that would be useful for school curriculums? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> something that crossed our mind, but now that you say it, that's good. David, you have a question? No, I was just thinking about one of the speakers, one of the speakers we had this year um, was Iini Kahalao, um, who, who in a sense, it, it was referred to by one of the students, um, redefined entrepreneurship, mm. because it wasn't just about profit. We talk a lot about the importance of being attentive to your community in which you're doing business. And so the pe you're being aware of the impact on people or the opportunity on people, the impact on planet or the opportunity to heal planet in addition to profit. And what she did really beautifully, um, they, they had a, a line of, of coloring books that were based on um, habitat, like a native forest or a coastline. And um, they are selling some to, um, Schools, Kamehameha School Press um, actually published some of their work. Um, but as an entrepreneur, which she conveyed to the cohort, um, she said, you know, we could probably be making more of our, they also do the 808 packs, the um, Cards Against Humanity, but Cards for, for Hawaii. Hawaii. Yeah, Cards for Hawaii. Um, she said, we could probably do, sell more, make more profit if we, in, if we just sold online. Our resources could be used in that way. But instead, she said, I want to sell them at stores whose values um, I want to promote. Because if they go in to get the cards, or they go in to get the coloring books at this place, they're probably going to find other products as well. And that's going to help that particular business. So there was something really special about that model. Um, and, and, and hearing someone who is in the community, very similar goals in terms of wanting to um, bring awareness um, of the challenges Hawaii faces. And so, um, that struck me, um, what an inspiring speaker, and, and to be able to have the students see that and say, she's making her way in the world, but she's spreading a lot off through entrepreneurship, it just encapsulated everything that we're doing. Does that sort of speak somewhat to, to what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. One last question, Jasmine. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. One last question, Jasmine. I want you to awkwardly close your eyes in front of everyone. Um, <laughs> And I want you to think about a specific memory that happened in that one. And I want you to share it with everyone. Do my eyes have to be closed? No, you don't. <laughs> okay. um. Okay. It was like, I'm going like to be really vulnerable here. It was probably like 11.30 at night on like last Wednesday. Um, we were like going through a bit of some family stuff and I was crying in my roommate. She was really helping me see the brighter side of things, and she really opened my eyes to a new way of thinking, a new way of like seeing and living my life to really make the best of it in the moment, mm -hmm. rather than like thinking always about the future, like doing good senior year, getting into a good college, graduating college, getting a job. Um, just taking the time to appreciate things here mm -hmm. and now. Mm -hmm. um, I had a good question, but I forgot it because that was so beautiful. Um, 
Thank you. Next group. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Logan. I'm Chloe. I'm Kinohi. And I'm Jamie. And we are Team, Team Tobacco. Tobacco. <laughs> Picture this. Picture this. A little girl, a 10 year old little girl, walking into the school bus, getting ready to go to school. She goes into the cafeteria, eats her favorite breakfast cereal, and all of a sudden, she reaches into her pocket and she pulls out, she pulls out a cancer causing, nicotine loaded, addictive stick of death, and she passes it around to her friends, and they all partake and hit, take a hit of the vape. Did you know that if you, did you know that if you vape during your adolescence, that it can cause harm, it can cause harm to the parts of your brain that are, are part, that the parts of your brain that take control of the, your attention, learning, um, your mood, and well, if you didn't, don't worry, because most of the people that we interviewed, they didn't know it either. You see, Big Tobacco has marketed to underage kids for a very, very long time. What once was the tobacco industry going out into marginalized and impoverished communities, actively handing out free cigarette packs, is now today the creation of flavors, like guava, Hawaiian punch, Lily Koi Lychee to actively hook another generation on nicotine. This is the status quo, and this is unsustainable. It has caused one third of Hawaii high school students and one fifth of Hawaii middle school students to actively use e-cigarettes. Again, this is unsustainable, and it has led us to our problem of ending the youth vaping epidemic. Now, I wanted to preface this by giving you a little context of how we found our solution, um, kind of just by going into our process. So after interviewing multiple stakeholders, professionals, and community leaders, we found that policy has failed us time and time again. This was reaffirmed by the fact in actually a few of our interviews with state representatives and legislators, we actually uncovered that our support for a flavored tobacco ban and other tobacco legislation and regulation was being removed and they will no longer, our key supporters will no, be, will no longer be supporting these measures through the Senate and the House. So at this moment in time, we kind of realized that we needed to come up with a new, more nuanced approach. So we went back to the drawing board, we did more research and realized that we need to be tackling this from a social perspective. So in summary, our solution is to create and, create and distribute vape collection boxes all across the islands to help incentivize this fundamental behavioral shift to creating this and to creating and reinforcing this social stigma around e-cigarettes. Art has the unique power to move people, and we want to harness that power in our unique project. The first step to quitting vaping is to no longer have access, no longer being able to reach into your pocket and take a hit whenever you want. We acknowledge it's going to be difficult to encourage people to take this first step. However, if people know that they are donating their vape towards a cause of building a sculpture, they can feel more inclined to do so. Additionally, the box is clear. This allows people to see the pile of vapes growing and piling up and feeling a, feel a sense of connection with those who have also donated their vapes towards this cause. Ultimately, we hope to instigate a ripple effect 
First, an initial group donates their vapes, which encourages more people to do so. And combined with the sculpture, we have an even greater impact. We took inspiration for our solution from the pollution to art movement. This movement, as you can see, can even generate revenue since these, since these sculptures made from trash can even be sold for a profit. We hope to eventually incorporate this within our business. As, as, and as you can see, art has been successful in taking pollution off of the streets, and we want to use art to take the vapes out of the hands of you. Project Tobacco plans to implement these donation boxes in all across Hawaii, specifically in er areas that will be in our target market, such as malls and schools. We want to encourage youth to make that decision themselves to quit vaping. They will that then we will collect our, their vapes and work with local artists to create, to transform these electronic wastes into art pieces so we could help spread awareness about our cause. After they drop off their vapes into the donation box, they can now scan a QR code which is on the box which will access our website to additional educational and addiction resources to get help. They can also register their vape to receive a monetary compensation for their vape. And to incentivize more people to donate their vapes, we will, be, we will use a tier system of rewards that is focused on referrals. For example, if you were to refer five of your friends, you can have access to choose which art piece to contribute to or commemorate a loved one who has faced addiction and has been negatively impacted by tobacco usage. This is a prototype of the sculpture we plan to build in the future. It will be made out of a variety of different vapes to create a wonderful, colorful, educational, unique work of art. And it would, it would have two sides. The first side would be the um, smoker's side, and the next would be the healthy side. And our plan is for it to be on some sort of rotating platform so you can see each side no matter what side of the room you're standing. We also would like to have some sort of informational plaque on the side so that the reader can find out information about like the causes of tobacco to the lungs and educational things. So this is the second part of our minimum viable product, our Instagram and our website. On our Instagram, we can track engagement. What do people want to see more of? Do they want more quantitative data or more qualitative data? From there, we can track the funnel from views to likes to clicks on our website, where we have educational content, as well as where the vape drop boxes are on island. So we hope to track and monetize engagement through our social media and website, specifically through ads that will offer these resources to help our consumers quit vaping. This includes gums, patches, hotlines, and local coaching for them to quit. We also help, uh, hope to use additional funding from grants and donations and eventually sell our art pieces to individuals, museum, or other venues through art auctions and admissions. So a little bit about our competitive landscape. Currently, there are multiple organizations in the field of tobacco cessation, but none of which that actually address all four pillars that we do. First, that's e-cigarette and tobacco education, um, educating uh, the public on the harms and the health effects of vaping. Second is waste, specifically e-waste, because tobacco products, believe it or not, contribute to the over 2.7 million tons of e-waste that fills our landfills. They also leak nearly a million pounds of toxic chemicals into our environment. Third, we also provide support for those who want to quit. And finally, we culminate all these aspects into this incorporation of this beautiful art exhibit to help boost our engagement, further our reach, and increase the education and awareness of our campaign. So here are the analytics of our social media and website from just the past 72 hours. We have about 190 individual visits to our website, as well as 50 followers on our Instagram. Now this is just in 72 hours, so we want to grow these numbers exponentially, as well as expand to TikTok, where we can attract our target audience, as well as create viral trends with hashtags like tag your friend, tag five friends to also donate, and also quit vaping too. 
Now a little bit about future partnerships. We actually already have our foot in the door with all these organizations pictured here. The main ones being the Hawaii Public Health Institute and the Coalition for Tobacco-Free Hawaii. Through these partnerships, we hope to again, boost our engagement, our impact, and our reach into our communities. Now a little bit about our team. We believe that we are the people to solve this issue because we are the age and racial demographic that these tobacco companies are targeting on a daily basis. We have seen firsthand in our communities, big tobacco ravage them, uproot them from their core. And we have seen our peers fall victim to these heinous acts of greed. On a personal note, on a personal note um, over the past four years, I have developed and honed my leadership and advocacy skills I've made personal connections with local politicians and community leaders. I bring to the team my leadership experience in student government and starting a social entrepreneurship club at school. I also bring my personal story as my dad has secondhand smoke. He suffers with it because his father smoked and he's had his quality of life greatly decreased, also his life expectancy, and he also has COPD. So I know firsthand the effects of smoking. I am passionate about this because in my community it is seen as socially acceptable and normal to own some type of tobacco or big product. And I see that as a big problem and I want to make an impact and a change, change in my community. And I have also seen what the effects of addiction can do to friends and families. With my prior experience in student leadership, running multiple businesses, and advocating through filmmaking, I know that it takes more than an individual, but a community to create this change. We are a team of artists and activists dedicated to a viable solution to shift the stigma of youth vaping while simultaneously reducing electronic waste, and we need your help. Please give our social media a visit, tobacco, at Tobacco Hawaii, Instagram and TikTok, and for our website, tobacco.org. Please spread the word to maybe five or more people. We really want to reach reach out to the greatest amount possible because we do plan on continuing this project after Nalukai. Thank you. It was a really wonderful presentation. And something that um, May Somali and Austin Stewart talked a lot about was this idea of ethos, logos, and pathos. Can you talk about that concept and how your slide deck and your presentation kind of leaned into that. We tried to lean into pathos, the more emotional parts of it, by sharing our own personal connection to this issue. Like I talked about how my dad's dad smoked and gave him secondhand smoke mm. and how that personally affects me. We also tried to lean into ethos or our credibility. Um, we drew on all our collective experiences in working to change our communities along with reaching out to community leaders and professionals in this field to gain the most nuanced understanding of our problem space and push forward to find a solution that hasn't yet been tried. We also try to incorporate logos, which is the logic part. We try to do, use our extensive research to provide statistics on what the problem really is. That was not staged. They literally just decided to stand up at different parts. Um, no, I, I think um, what was remarkable about your presentation is, is how you all feel this and how you all um, are impacted by it in interesting ways. Something that is problematic about schools is that they um, ask our students to always be perfect. And though they say there is room for failure, there's very little room for failure. And so what's really hard at Nalukai, and why the first couple days are so vital, um, is that we try to make them feel seen and try to make them understand that they don't need to be perfect either. And then in fact, failure is incredibly important in the entrepreneurial process. Tell me, I want to start with you, um, how you dealt with that. Because we asked a lot and we didn't want you to be right all of the time which can be an antithesis to school or the college application process. Absolutely. So when I first came into Nalukai, I thought I had a pretty good understanding of our problem space, of the youth vaping epidemic. I'd been advocating previously for it for my entire high school career, um, particularly on the policy side. And that's where I was completely wrong. 
see after reaching out and actually talking more with these politicians in depth after this past legislative session, we realized that we no longer have the support that we once had to push forth these bills um, through the Senate and through the House. Um, actually, in this past legislative ses session, one of our main bills was actually vetoed by Ige. So um, we know that we lost support, and we know that it's no longer really a viable option. So that's where. Yeah. For you. For me, I came into Nolukai as a recovering perfectionist. <laughs> <laughs> I was definitely good at school. I was good at achieving things, but not so good at dealing with failure. It was very hard to. It was always very hard for me to take that and process that. But at Nalukai, failure is just a part of growth. Even when you fail, you can learn something and you can just edit it, incorporate it into your next prototype. Um, when I came here, I thought like we were gonna get graded on everything. <laughs> <laughs> and like, I tried to make everything perfect. So, and when we have like a couple failures, not failures, but like we had times where we failed and we need to try again and find a new solution. And I thought that that was us getting like a big F, but then I realized that it's just us growing to be better. Yes, like they mentioned, I think failure is a vital part of growth, especially um, as we shifted from our problem to tobacco usage and we shifted our solution. We had to use that failure to make a pivot and in the end, we ended up learning more and Questions from the audience. Our last opportunity to ask questions. So, this is a little bit of a touch. I'm going to take a couple of seconds, though. Um, and this is for all of the, the projects as well. Um, I was invited to attend. Um, I am the director for research and development, which is the economic development organization here in the county. Mm -hmm. I was in, invited to attend um, to kind of hear what the projects about and I'm blown away mm -hmm. first of all. Um, first of all, the creativity among all of them is just amazing, right? Um, and then the passion that you're bringing to, particularly this last one, the passion that you're bringing to the, um, the solution sets, you know, that you're applying to, to the problems that you've identified is, is amazing. What I'd like to say is when we're talking about entrepreneurship, it isn't just about you. Mm -hmm. Right? You are leaders. I daily think about the economy of this island. Right? And I think about how are we making sure that we're providing the kind of jobs that folks can earn a livelihood at. Right? And I don't want to put too much pressure on you, but I'm done. Because you've already demonstrated that you have the capability to do it. You're the ones that are going to make sure that those jobs come around. Right? By doing these kinds of things. It's these kinds of things that folks will want to be involved in that will provide meaning, not just in their lives, but in their work. And so I really appreciate all the work that you've done over the last week and a half and bringing this forward as well. And keep it going. Mm -hmm. Great. Other questions? we could focus on that. I mean, as you learn too, at Nalukai, they really put, the, they really teach you to focus on a specific problem, to have a small scope so that you can create that difference and then expand. So yeah, maybe in the future. Joel, oh, sorry. You folks had a deck that was uh, talked about the partnerships um, that you folks were looking to connect with. Um, did you folks make some phone calls and kind of what came out of those, that, that research with those partners? Yeah, so for our partnerships, um, I've actually led the Coalition for Tobacco-Free Hawaii's Youth Council and worked with the Hawaii Public Health Institute for the past four years. So kind of through them, I can just, uh, I approached my mentor, I said, hey, do you like our idea? And essentially, <laughs> we'll, we'll be able to get um, that awareness aspect and 
hopefully be able to partner or be absorbed into the Hawaii Public Health Institute as a whole, um, they'll definitely broaden our impact. Great. Thank you. Since you're targeting you, did you have one-on-one -on -one conversations with you? And if you did, what was that like for them to open up to something that you know might be shameful, might be hard for them to admit, and yeah, get them to a place of helping you understand the issue? Yeah, we talked to a bunch of different people, a variety of youth, some who tried vaping and stopped, some who actively and currently vaped, and we got a lot of variety of perspectives we noticed the people who tried vaping but quit, they seem to be a little more aware of the health effects, while the people who actively vaped or addicted and continue to continue with their addiction, they didn't seem as aware about the health effects or the long-term impact. But also socially, they were in a position where they didn't have support to quit their addiction. So we learned a lot about the social aspects. In the beginning, I think we were a little more focused on policy, but one common thread that we heard a lot was that a legislative or a law wouldn't really stop people, it seemed. These teens, they said, I would continue vaping even if there was a law against it. So that's just some of what we learned. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to the extent of what Chloe said because we actually interviewed a handful of college students on the mainland. They said in states where tobacco regulation had been implant, implemented, uh, their friends would drive out of state mm -hmm. to get these products and bring it back in um, and deal them. So we know the extent to which policy actually does not work and we've noticed, again, it's definitely a social pattern um, amongst youth. So one of, your goal, one of our goals as an organization in Aukai is to demystify entrepreneurship, to kind of D. Elon Musk entrepreneurship, if you will. Um, and, and to have entrepreneurship really be rooted in community and relationships, taking big lessons from Hawaii and indigenous culture, your problem is, or your solution is very communal in nature. How did, how did you think about community through the a problem and solution process? Absolutely, I think I can speak on behalf of all of us here. Um, we're all native Hawaiian or from some indigenous culture. And I think, thinking through this, uh, Native Hawaiians in particular, particular are extremely disproportionately impacted by the tobacco industry. Uh, indigenous and Native groups use e-cigarettes e at significantly higher rates. 78% um, of Native Hawaiians actually use menthol cigarettes. That's a specific flavor, a minty flavor. So we know that um, walking through the problem and the solution space, we kept all of this in mind and we kept grounded really in our culture, our community, because these statistics, we didn't want them to define where we came from, but we wanted to have some kind of impact on them. Thank you. Thank you. Before, before we do a brief um, kind of general Q&A um, for all the founders, I wanted to invite up our director of curriculum, Austin Stewart, who is also um, doing the stream, who's wearing many hats as usual. And, and I'd like Austin to briefly speak to um, what you all saw today. Hey everyone, I'm Austin Stewart. I sit on the board of Malachi Foundation. I also act as director of curriculum. Uh, which means that I get to set the broad strokes of the program, uh, the learning that we do here, uh, which is a great honor. Uh, I'm going to cry. <laughs> you guys are so good. It's killing me. Um, so, you got this, Austin. Okay. So I, I firstly wanted to say um, how fitting I think it is for me um, to be working with this group here at uh, UH Hilo. Um, my wife and I moved to Hilo in 2010, so it's been 12 years now that we've lived here. Uh, when we first moved here, we didn't have a lot of friends. Uh, we found community through a little group called Hawaii TechWorks, uh, which was largely a group of nerdy computer science students <laughs> from the UH Hilo Computer Science Department. Uh, and we had tons of fun, you know, playing board games together. And that was kind of my first introduction 
to community. Um, and I was, I was fortunate that I was kind of ahead of the curve on remote work, so I was sort of working for my you know, Silicon Valley job while living here in, in Hawaii. Um, but sort of, you know, year by year, that group of people that we had disappeared as each one of them tried to find opportunity here and then ended up moving back to the mainland. Some sort of held on longer than others, but in the end, the whole group was gone. Um, and then in 2016, uh, I had you know, decided to leave Twitch where I had been working uh, for you know, a few years, including through its acquisition by Amazon, which resulted in a life-changing sort of uh, uh, event for me in terms of my personal finances. I suddenly had the ability um, to do things that I thought were important and not just do things that I needed to keep my family going. Um, and so I thought, why aren't there more people in our community who can take advantage of the incredible opportunities that the global information economy provides? Um, because if we don't do that, the people who, who love this place, who want to defend the values of this place, can't stay in this place. Um, and I'd have no one to play board games with. <laughs> so it so happened that um, one of, the, uh, one of the, the people who ran Hawaii TechWorks, Don Kosak, was also a board member for not this organization called Nalakai Foundation. And they had this camp called Nalakai Academy that taught people entrepreneurship skills. Uh, and so I said, I'm gonna sign me up. And that was like 2017, and it's now been 2018, 2019, 2020, 2021, now 2022. Um, I've been blessed that I've been able to bring what I learned in Silicon Valley um, the practices, the things that you use to engineer success and share them with a group of people that hold so much promise uh, and are the ones who are going to really lead this community forward. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm looking to them as, as a father to, to two children who have grown up here. And I'm so excited to see the world that they create mm -hmm. and what they bring to this community. Um, so. That's all I have to say for now. <laughs> I'm not going to go collapse over there. <laughs> but thank you, everyone. And thank you so much to the 2022 cohort. You guys are amazing. So much love, so much respect. Thank you so much for being a part of this program, for being the lifeblood of this program. Thank you. Thank you. So we, we not only got Alan Marbayashi for five days, the incomparable Mesa Maui yeah. for the entire time, cool. we got Pull My Fertile for five days. Amazing. And the thing you were geeking out and the most excited about was this 20 minute presentation that you and Pumai were going to do together, which I missed and I can't wait to see the recording of it. What was the power of that presentation? What was the context of it? Right. So. We've always wanted to have culture be essential to camp, uh, specifically UK Hawaii, uh, be part of camp because we want a form of entrepreneurship that not only generates prosperity, but which creates culturally affirming work um, for the people who live here. And so we, we've always had a thread of culture, right? We had you know, cultural activities and things like that, but this was really the year when, and it's really Paul Michael Roland who made this possible, when we are able to weave EK Hawaii and the, so, the social entrepreneurship curriculum that I said is sort of developed from my entrepreneurship experiences on the mainland and elsewhere uh, into one sort of tapestry where you know, EK Hawaii is informing how we think about entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship is informing how we think about EK Hawaii. And so we have this really, I had this incredible opportunity to, to co-facilitate with Pomai Burrowman where she talked about her experience as a navigator, being out on the ocean, having to take regular measurements, right? To figure out where they were going so that they could navigate toward a destination. And the process of that, the work of that, that you don't always see, because we see destinations, we see arrivals, right? We see them getting the lays in Tahiti, but you don't see what it's like having to get up when the sun is at a certain angle, because you need to be able to measure at that moment to know precisely where you are in the ocean so you can make course corrections. And how that applies to entrepreneurship and the work of entrepreneurship, we see so many bad examples of entrepreneurship, right? A big product releases, crazy stuff like that. But what we don't always see is the work of waking up early in the morning, trying to figure out what's going on with your customers, 
Are we headed in the right direction? Are we on target? Are we below target? And having to make decisions, and make little course corrections, right? In the process, the work, the hunt up. That's really what it's about. Um, and to be able to co-facilitate with, with Pomai Berlman uh, on that, it was, it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Uh, so just life-changing. And I'm so grateful to Pomai uh, for that opportunity and experience. Thank you. And sit down. Okay. <laughs>factors. Um, it's, the, it's the pitches and presentations of products and ideas that our founders come up with. Um, it's, the, um, it's the ability for them to showcase their learning and learn truly through makahana ike, through, through action, through iteration. Most importantly, it's the relationships and the communities they form. And a wide um, network of alumni that have gone through this program for seven years. Some who were in their first jobs, some were in college, some who are still in high school like you saw today. And the number one technical skill that comes out of Nalukai is that ability to connect with others. It's the most important skill that we have seen time after time after time. And so I just wanna give a huge round of applause for these founders for totally demonstrating that power <laughs> of human We have a few minutes left. Um, we're going to have some closing remarks by our executive director, David Clark. But before we do that, I'd love for some general questions to anyone in the cohort, to any facilitators. Um, and I would, I would awkwardly get everyone up here, but we're not going to do that in the interest of time. Um, Gabby is just going to kind of point the webcam that way. So um, if, the, if the Holy Spirit of inquiry moves you, um, please ask a question to this incredible cohort or to a specific person. Or we can also sit in beautiful silence. Quick <laughs> <laughs> uh, question What type of icebreakers did you focus on? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Because that's pretty critical when you get a group of students from all different areas. So, yeah. I'm just interested in what you focus on. I think David Clark can answer that question. Um, I actually think they should probably answer that um, in terms of what impacted, what activities were done that helped you understand each other from the very beginning um, until the point where you could work on a product together, work on a solution to something you really, really cared about, the, and, and offer feedback that was often quite blunt. Jasmine, start us off. Hi, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> I think the biggest icebreaker was on the night of day two. We all sat in a circle and shared our biographies for the sake of everyone's privacy. I'm not going to get into details about that, but I really feel like we got to know each other on a more personal, intimate level through that. Yeah, call in. I'll just add on to that, we, on the first day we did a PSA assignment, it was like a public service thing, and your daughter really took one for the team, <laughs> rolling in the ground and rolling on the grass, so we had to film like imaginary concepts, which really brought us together as a team, because everyone had to do something funny, do something silly, something like that. <laughs> Excellent. Say like shocked about when I came to Nalakai was just how much prompted conversation there was going to be. They put us into groups, they put us into pairs, and they would give us a question like, oh, talk about this, talk about that. And being forced to talk about something and giving it as like an assignment point of view, really like, I noticed a lot of us are really academic based. So really put that into perspective and made conversation much easier. Because when you put it as an assignment, oh, all of a sudden I can do it. It's so easy. It's so simple. <laughs> and, Anna. Oh, sorry. Okay. Uh, and for me, one of the simplest ways I would just introduce myself is like, oh, I really like your shoes. I really like your shirt. Just find something to compliment someone over, and eventually you'll start talking. You'll start figuring something out. Um, just like everyone else said, we had a lot of activity. Uh, the PSA was one of them. That was really nice. It was a way to find an imaginary problem and come up with a video that really warm 
warns everyone about it. Um, like Jasmine was talking about, day two, that was, that was really nice, you know? Um, to, put it in, to put it into perspective, we were all told to go in a circle and say in two minutes one thing that we wanted to say about ourselves. And I think that really like opened everyone up, you know? Um, and I think the last activity for the icebreakers was the, the boxes, the maze. That was so frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> it was thinking outside the box. You had, a, you had a question over here. I really commend our leaders as a group. I just retired as an educator after 55 years. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> lastly, doing a UH Manoa outreach in STEM, mm -hmm. I've seen a lot of student leaders. Great promise for our state. My question to all of you, because this is my passion as I'm retreating, how can we get you back to Hawaii after your talent takes you to who knows where? How can we get you back here? Because this truly is the best place on the planet. Mm. <laughs> it truly is. We need you here. Of course you want to go out and see the world. We have and we believe in global harmony above all. But well, how can we get to that? Is that in your vision? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Beautiful. And thank you, by the way, for your many years oh, of working with young people. <laughs> thank you. And, and really appreciate your question because it gets at the core of what we're trying to do here. What we've realized in, 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 in the forming of the program we want to create a community and expand that community such that they have allies so that if they do go off to the continent for college that, and they want to come home, that, they, that there's a possibility to do so. That we haven't been completely sort of gentrified out of the housing market, for instance, or, or needing to go you know, for four or five years to save up money and live in, live in someone's you know, back room or in their ohana or in someone's basement. Um, it's a really tough challenge, and it was one of the, one of the reasons that Nalu kind of started was so that they can create a network and stay in touch with each other through our alumni program, where we continue to offer them speakers, continue to offer them resources, um, so that they can collaborate. So that so that if Mahina has an idea and she needs a web designer. Um, she can go to that network and say, there's someone here who lives on Maui who's also doing that. Maybe we can get together and, and, and work. And now it's a little easier to work virtually. So part of the vision is to, to foster the connections that have already been established. But I, I also noted that your question is to them. You know? <laughs> do you want to, and, and, and should be, do you want to, um, and what do you need in order to do so? Colette, well, and that's it. Um, I personally want to leave the island to go to college because they have a lot of schools and programs that they don't necessarily offer all here. But coming to this camp made me realize I do want to move back here after college and experiencing a different life because I've made all these connections with so many wonderful people and that I'll have lots of opportunities that I thought I wouldn't have had. Like I didn't realize I had so many opportunities before coming to this camp. So it was a very great experience to see and make the connections with all these people. So. Um, you know, I've never been super into Hawaiian culture, like, that sounds bad, but, um, mm -hmm. was it, my family, we weren't, we weren't really, like, Hawaiian Ike, right, mm -hmm. and, um, was it, ever since I was, like, 14 years old and I was young, all I wanted to do was leave Kauai, I wanted to leave Hawaii, and, you know, recently, growing up, growing up, being older, finding what I love, finding my passions, because it's not just art that I love, it's also like our plants. It's weird, I hate dirt, but I love plants. And especially Hawaiian native plants. I especially connected to the coloring book presentation, because I would love to buy something like that for myself and my future children. Um, you know, I think in some way, home will always call to us, 
and a big emphasis on Hawaiian culture is what really drew me back into oh, learning about the traditional Polynesian practices of medicine, learning how these plants were used in a practical sense, and being able to apply it to things I'm passionate about was really a wonderful thing to learn. And I personally don't want to leave Hawaii anymore. I, I don't plan on going to college. And if I did, I would love to attend college here in Hawaii. Because it's like you said, this place is quite literally paradise. Sure, we do have our ups and downs, such as the tourism industry and the housing market, like Uncle Davey said. But, um, <laughs> you know, home will always call back to us. And I think if we really bring that emphasis to home in our education and just our daily lives, it will call back to a lot more people. So after they see the world, after they take their opportunities, they can always come back home. And I think, I think that'll be a great thing. Um, just kind of adding on to what Kalei said about leaving. Uh, I personally, like my family has always been trying to get me like off island. They want me to go international for college. I saw like four years left to figure that out. But anyway, um, when I saw May, our guest speaker here, she came all the way from Australia. And you see like how successful she is, how well-rounded. She gets to like go all over the place. She gets all these business ventures. And now it's like, well, now you kind of have to go and see the world, right? Like, you have all these inspiring people around you, like, mm -hmm. Lily's going to Europe, um, Logan's going to Stanford. These people are just going, like, all over the world, and maybe they'll come back home someday, and they'll bring, like, a unique perspective to, like, our new community leaders here in Hawaii. Nice.
and stay the course. And you know, sometimes the timeline can be different, but if, if we keep the integrity and, and the values that we've all been talking about today, perhaps those can help be helpful in guiding you back home mm -hmm. when the time's right for you. Thank you. Um, it's touching. It's a similar journey. I was away for 17 years and got to come back home. And um, I grew up on Oahu as well. And uh, came over here and, and was a teacher for the first time uh, at Parker School back in the in the early early 90s, um, which is where I met. Um, Bubba Darius Monsef, who went off and eventually created the vision that we're all here for right now. Um, until I moved to the Big Island, until I moved to Hawaii Island, I never, I never felt invited into culture as 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 a Hawaii guy <laughs> from Oahu. But I moved here, and um, I felt like I had an invitation. I felt like I had an invitation to engage with, to learn, to learn language, and, and, and what we've all learned from our speakers is, is that the naming of things here um, helps breathe life into them. Um, and when we forget those names of certain places, uh, of certain traditions, um, we lose something that is imperative to this place. So. To have a program where we get students to come together and grapple with these things and meet with community leaders and meet with practitioners and meet with tech people who he very humbly said, oh, I work for Twitch. Um, but actually what Austin did in his bedroom in Hilo was create the mobile interface for Twitch, which is huge. And though he said in his, <laughs> Matt, in, in his, um, when he presented with Momai, Momai gave this amazing, these, this nuanced understanding of what navigating means when you're in the middle of between Hawaii and Tahiti. Um, and some of the mistakes made um, and the lessons learned of how do you know exactly where you are? And it was beautiful. And, uh, and Austin was just about to go into the importance of monitoring analytics for your, uh, on your, for your social media. And he stood up and he said, so I'm follow, following Pumai. She just talked about basically recreating one of the greatest moments of human history in this navigation from Hawaii to Tahiti and back on Hokulea. And, and, and I, made a, I made a program where kids can watch other kids play video games. <laughs> right? And he diminished it. But it was really, really important. Because what we try to do is create a place where those traditions are valued, where those traditions that, that we foster a reverence for what is here. And to go to that fish pond and to hear from somebody who spends, we have so much of his time referring to the place as if it's a person. And it is a person. And the plants as if they're people and they, they, they are people in many ways. Um, to get that and then to also get the opportunity to work with young people who say, I want to create a coloring book because people should know that there's a species on Kaho'olawe there's only one of in the wild. And you should know that name of that place. And we should offer to our keiki um, a place to color it and, and, and learn about the history. At the same time, we have another group of people who want to say, um, we're being marketed to as a people. By, a tobacco, by tobacco companies and by vape companies. And we've got to do something about it because our government is saying, we, we, yeah, we, we, we think it shouldn't happen, but there's all, there's all kinds of nuance to that problem and with, it, with our existing structures. And how do you navigate that as a 15-year-old or 16-year-old or 17-year-old or 53-year-old? How did that happen so fast? Um, so we try to provide that invitation. We want, to, we want to engage with you folks, not as teachers to students, as if there's some hierarchical difference based on the experience we have um, or the knowledge that we have. But we want to pull out from you what your experience has been. That's what we've attempted to do. And in doing so, by bringing in people who are practitioners and experts, we try to give invitation to you to say, please join us in the solution. 
Please join us in understanding the nuance of these problems. Doug Adams, I thank you for being here today, and I thank you for your work of service. I know that the problems that you face are not as simple as somebody doesn't want to do this because they're taking a payout. It's not that simple at all. And so if we can all understand that these are much more complex problems that we have, then maybe we can do something to authentically change them. And you all, we need your voice on that. Who better to solve, to offer solution to problems around tobacco cessation than the people who are being marketed to by our companies? I remember being in high school and this huge debate on whether or not a Pepsi machine was going to be allowed on campus because should we be selling to, to high school students and middle school students? And think about the number of ads you all face in a single day specifically directed to you. It's changed. How do we change it so that our values here get perpetuated? That's what we try and do at Malokai more than anything. And I thank you all for taking the call, for eating it, and for joining us and giving your best to this. I think about the problems you want to solve around food waste, which hits the environment. To think about what your experience was like as COVID and to offer to other people the chance to, to sit in different, more comfortable positions as we've been quarantined for two years, that becomes a really real issue. I think about all of the problems that you're trying to, to solve. As a, as a teacher myself, I also thank you for trying to say, it's not right that our system is such that teachers are given 600 bucks of their own. On average, there are 3.2 million teachers in the public school system in this country. That's a lot of money that's coming out of pockets from people. How can we change that? And so if they've created something that allows to amplify some really interesting suggestions, some things that are already in existence, like a registry for Amazon for teachers, if there's a way to centralize it around your community, great, maybe that helps. Maybe that helps make it more affordable to buy a house here and to be a really interesting teacher who wants to spend their career learning about this and helping guide young people. Or maybe you think that music should be more present in our young people's lives. And the first thing that often gets cut in schools is access to the arts. And so you combine something people are already playing with, a fidget spinner kind of thing, right, with something that actually gives you some base um, experience with what a musical instrument can be. And maybe you're helping that student who has been disengaged by school because they don't have music there. So the fact that you all are looking to solve the important issues, it's inspiring to me. It's inspiring to all of us who get the chance to work with you. If it's inspiring to you all, please help, because we want to do more of these. We want to reach more students. Um, our program is completely free to everybody involved, and they're armed with a laptop that I think can help them connect with each other, help them create solutions, present these solutions, um, and connect with the larger world. So maybe it is a little bit more viable for them to work here this place has so much to offer. The world needs aloha in, in huge ways. We need to figure out how to export it. And maybe bringing you folks home and giving a chance for you to be here, that, maybe that matters. Maybe it's a way we can, we, can, we can help solve this problem. So I thank you for your comment and your service for so many years dedicated to young people. Um, I thank you all for joining us today. Um, it supports them. It gives them a chance to do something in a professional setting that you know, maybe this business idea will be the thing that launches them. Maybe it won't. One of our, our founder actually said to them, you know, probably you're, at your age with your experience, your first couple of ideas are probably not gonna, you know, make it out and make it be home runs. But the way you get there is by putting in the work to run one, two, three, four, five organizations. Try it out. And I think that they're, I don't know, I hope it's true that you're going to be more likely to take that step, right, from the maze. That maybe you're going to go and say, you know what, it's, all right, it doesn't feel good to fail, but you know what, I can learn from it. It's no longer a failure if I learn from it. And my next one's going to be even sharper. My next one is going to be even better. And then you make your way across. So if you like the work that we're doing, this is the part of my job as executive director that I started out really disliking because I do not like asking people for money. Um, 
But what I realized was the way that we can do more of this is to accumulate some of that so that we can run these programs. So if you're watching and you liked what you heard, please make a donation to an organization that matters. Maybe it's to a fish pond. Maybe it's to us. I would appreciate it if it were us. Um, <laughs> I hope you all are going to be more engaged in your community. Because you created a beautiful one here. And we're so honored to spend time with you. And thank you for coming. Um, and thank you for watching today. So um, stay connected to us through, through our website, nalukai.org. Um, there is a donate button there. Um, we currently have a matching grant going on. Someone who's um, doubling up to $5,000 um, uh, gifts that are made. So please, um, think about it, consider it. We know times are tough. The pandemic has been rough for lots of us here. Um, organizations that are doing good work. Um, so find the ones in your community that resonate with you um, and please be generous, either with your time, like you all did in the fish pond um, the other day, um, or in whatever ways that you can. Mahalo for joining us at Malukai. Aloha.